The future belongs to those who can take the kids. The future of what God wants to do cannot happen without the next generation. That's why God wants you to have children. This is what's going to happen to your kids. They will join forces with the church. God needs babies because the church's future is going to be mixed with the youth. I want you to shake off disappointment. Rise up in your destiny and in your calling because the best days are coming to your house. Your best days were not before, they are still ahead of you. I'm here to remind you prophetically, God is on the move. If it's not good, God's not done yet. He's still working behind the scenes and He will do a miracle in your midst, says the Lord. Judges chapter 16 and verse 26 and 27 it says the following then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand let me feel the pillars which support the temple that I may lean on them now the temple was full of men and women all of the lords of the Philistines were there about 3,000 men and women on the roof while watching Samson perform and if we skip two verses we go to verse 30 so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life I'm gonna give you 10 points I'm one of those preachers that have 10 or more points so I want you to pull out your phone and I want you to stay engaged with me or you're gonna write some things down because I really want to take you through the church history through the life of Samson and show you where we are at prophetically and where God is taking us I'm going to use the story of Samson. Everything started with Samson like this. If you read the book of Judges, you will see that Israel sinned. They got into trouble. They got into bondage. And then they cried out and God sent a deliverer, except Samson. In Samson's story, they sinned, they got in bondage and nobody cried out. Samson was the only judge that was given as an answer to a prayerless generation. That's why when he arrived, they didn't embrace him. That's why when he arrived, they couldn't receive him. Every judge in the book of Judges always moved with the nation. But when God brought Samson to a generation that was not even asking for him, but they needed him, they couldn't embrace him. God will still do revival if we don't pray. We just won't be a part of it. We don't pray to get revival. We pray so we can be positioned when it comes that we're in the center of it. Samson was God's gift to a prayerless generation. God sent Samson when there was no prayer and therefore Samson was not embraced by them. Prayer does not just prepare me for an answer. Prayer does not just prepare an answer. It prepares me for that answer. Maybe some of you are saying, what's the point of praying? God is sovereign. What's the point of fasting? God is going to do what God is going to do. You will miss it. God will do it right in front of your nose and you will criticize it. You will post about it. You will critique it but you will not be a part of it because prayer moves you to the flow of the power and the revival that is happening in your generation. Prayer will give you the discernment that when God is moving to go there, to go watch that movie, buy that book and be a part of what God is doing in this world. Can somebody say Amen. The first thing that I want to share with you about Samson and that's something about the church is Samson was born anointed and the church was born on the day of Pentecost anointed. Not educated but anointed. Not connected but anointed. Not with a non-profit status, but anointed. Without Facebook, but anointed. Without the Google ads, but anointed. The first day of the church's birth was power of the Holy Spirit coming upon church. Samson did not know a day in his early life where he was not anointed. There was an anointing that he was born with. And that's exactly what happened with the church over 2,000 years ago. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. Your calling needs anointing. We live in the generation today in America and I am for education. I'm currently enrolled in a Bible seminary. I am going through a Bible college because I started the ministry and didn't get the college degree and didn't learn that stuff. So I'm going through it right now. So I believe in education. Do not get me wrong. 
Education does not drive out demons. A degree does not heal cancer. Anointing breaks the yoke. We have many men and many women of God today who have more degrees than a Fahrenheit. But they cannot heal a flu. They cannot rebuke a fever. Why? Because it takes anointing. And Jesus did not say, wait in Jerusalem until you get your PhD. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you get endued with power from on high. Somebody shout, Holy Ghost. We need Him again in the church. We need His power again in the church. We need His anointing again in the church. A calling without anointing becomes your graveyard. Calling without anointing is dangerous. But your calling with anointing makes you dangerous. Write that down. A calling without anointing is dangerous because you're fighting with spiritual principalities. You're not just trying to influence people. We are not motivational speakers. We are preachers of the gospel. We preach eternal gospel to save lost men from going from eternity, damnation to a salvation with God. But a calling with anointing makes you dangerous. Sometimes people say, because I'm in Washington, and people say, you know, how are you doing there? You must understand is the anointing of the Holy Spirit does not need a good place or a Bible belt to bring a breakthrough. You may be in the place right now where you're saying it's a graveyard. It's just perfect for the anointing. It might not be perfect for your personality. It's probably not good. Your wife might not like it. Your kids might not like it. But the anointing of God can thrive in the places where religion dies. Can somebody say amen? The second thing I want you to notice about Samson, not only he was born anointed and every calling requires anointing, but the second thing is that Samson went against the gates and the gates of hell, the Bible says, will not prevail against the church. During one of those times we see Samson actually picked up the gates and they couldn't keep him in the city. Instead, he tore those gates apart and went through them. That's exactly what Jesus called the church to do. He says, the church I will build and that's why I want to challenge every pastor. The church you build will not prevail against the gates. The church he builds will prevail against the church. That's why I don't like to say my church because it's not mine. I didn't die for it. I'm not living for it. It's Jesus' church. And his church will go against the gates of hell. One of the church's assignments, Jesus' first mention of the local church involved spiritual warfare. It didn't involve nursery. It did not involve kids ministry. It did not involve coffee shop. It did not involve small groups. It did not involve a secretary and the church email. It did not involve a bulletin. It did not involve a building. It involved a cosmic conflict between the gates of hell and the local body of Jesus Christ. That means if the church is not driving out demons, I want to ask a question, whose church it is? Maybe it's the Baptist church. Maybe it's the Pentecostal church. Maybe it's the Presbyterian. But Jesus' church will have a beef with demons. I don't want to be an Assemblies of God church. I want to be a church that plunders gates. I don't want to be a Baptist church, not against assemblies, we're assemblies of God, not against the Baptists, but Jesus' church deals with gates. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church's identity, the first mention, the law of first mention as theologians teach us, reveal us so much about a particular topic. The law of first mention about the church deals right away with conflict, with spiritual forces. So those people who divorce deliverance from the church and they say it's weird, puking, throwing up, uncomfortable. If you take deliverance from the church, you rob the church from its identity. Because the first mention of the church deals with the conflict. Today when you start a church, the first thing you ask is where are we going to meet? Not are we going to cast out demons or not? The first question we ask, who's going to be our music director? Who's going to be our kids director? Not, 
on how are we going to fight against the gates. A church of Jesus Christ is a church that's militant. It's not a babysitting club. It's a militant army. It's not an audience. It's an army. Can somebody say amen? Number three. Samson sent foxes to the fields. The church sent evangelists, teachers, pastors. They sent men and women of God into the world, the Greco-Roman world. The church started to spread because Samson, what Samson did under the anointing of God that he was operating, he took 300 foxes, tied them by twos in their tails, put fire in their tail and he released them into the field of the Philistines. I want you to notice this. First of all, catching foxes is not easy. Tying their tails is not easy. I have a dog, touch him by his tail, you're in trouble. Touching both of their tails and tying them together is very difficult task. It's kind of like bringing unity in the body of Christ. It's not easy. It's like bringing two people who disagree. It's like touching their tail. It's very, very difficult, but it's not impossible. And the Bible says he put fire not on their nose, but in their tail. What does that mean? It's whatever they went, fire followed. And that's exactly what happened with the gospel. It's what happens is even now. When you begin to believe with another believer, two or three, the Bible says, there I am among them. And Jesus says, these signs will follow. They are in our tail, if I can use that verbiage. Meaning whatever we go, they go. So we don't follow these signs, they follow us. Because we are the foxes that Jesus has put the fire of the Holy Ghost inside of us. So if I go to the mall, the fire goes in the mall. If I go to school, the fire goes to school. If I go to my family, the fire goes to my family. Somebody shout fire. But the fire is not for show. The fire is not to, so you can have a fire international ministry. The fire is not so you can have a nonprofit. The fire is not so you can grow a YouTube. The fire is so that the fields will go up in smoke. The fire is so that the sick will be healed and the demonized will be set free. The fire is so that the cancel will be broken off and the lost will be saved. Somebody shout fire. Are you with me? Number four. Samson killed with the jawbone. The church conquers with its mouth. We don't conquer with the sword. We don't conquer with our fist. We don't conquer with lawsuits. We win the world with our mouth. No wonder one of the first things Holy Ghost decided to affect after filling us is not our feet, it's our mouth. The hardest thing to control is your mouth. God gave us two ears, one mouth. Unfortunately, most of us think God gave us two mouths and one ear. The way the church advances in this world is through the mouth. What I'm doing right now is running my mouth. How people's lives are changed is through the preaching of the gospel. Not through the punching. We don't punch demons out. We yell at them. We command them out. It's through our mouth. We prophesy through our mouth. We praise through our mouth. We preach through our mouth. So the greatest attack of Satan on your life will be your mouth. Because it is God's only outlet to a dying world. That's why the enemy will seek to fill your mouth with gossip. So you will discuss people. So you will attack people. So you will criticize other people. Why? So that your mouth is no longer used as a jawbone in the hands of God. But then it's used as a tool in the hands of the devil to bring division, to bring toxic environment and to set you against another brother. God anointed you to win souls, not to win arguments. God wants to give you grace so you preach the gospel, not so you post your opinion. Your mouth has power and God wants to use it. The church spread through the preaching and the church still does. Number five. Okay, all of this was a warm-up. Samson compromised and lost his anointing. That's exactly what happened to the church. If you read the church history, you will see 
When a Constantine became the emperor, it was a glorious day, the Edict of Ilan, when we had no longer persecution. And then another emperor right after him made Christianity the national religion. And while that was great, but Christianity went from being persecuted to being popular. And it seems like we did better being persecuted than being popular. We did better with suffering than with success. Because what started to happen with the early church is a lot of weird doctrines started to creep in. What is what happened in medieval church, what happened in middle ages, when the church, when the Pope became more powerful than any person on the planet, less than God, greater than man, like Pope Innocent said of himself. And we saw the church start going and killing Muslim people. We saw the church start compromising. We saw false doctrines start coming into the church and the compromise brought its defeat. When Samson started to compromise, he lost the anointing. He didn't lose his appointing, he lost his anointing. Today's compromise is tomorrow's defeat. Today's prayerlessness is tomorrow's powerlessness. Today's fantasizing about a woman that is not your spouse is tomorrow's adultery. Today's flirting with sin is tomorrow being bound by sin. The Bible says through Joshua, God said to the Israel, He says, sanctify yourself for tomorrow. Somebody shout, tomorrow. I will do wonders in your midst. That means that today's sanctification is tomorrow's conquest. Today's prayer is tomorrow's power. And that's why some of us get discouraged because we're like, I fasted today, but I didn't see the breakthrough. Well, when you have intimacy today, you don't get the baby today. The baby comes nine months later. Today's purity is tomorrow's marriage. Today's tithing is tomorrow's breakthrough. Today's obedience is tomorrow's blessing from God. I want to challenge you right now that the church needs to return to its consecration, to its concentration, to, to focus on God. The Bible says that Samson compromised and Samson lost the anointing. Number six, Samson was bound, blind and went in circles. When he lost the anointing, a few things happened. Number one, he got bound. Number two, he went blind. And number three, he started going in circles. And that's exactly what happened to the church of Jesus Christ for hundreds of years until Martin Luther ripped the blindness off of the church. But the church was going blind. The church was going bound. And the church was going in circles. The same thing and the same thing. What happens when you lose the anointing, something begins to happen. You get into bondage. You lose your vision. And you get into mediocrity. You get into complacency. Everything is the same and you can't break the cycle of the same. Jesus is the same. You shouldn't be. I shouldn't be. Christ is the same yesterday. That means going in circles, blind and bound is what was the state of the church. And maybe you are here right now and that is your state. You feel blind, you feel bound and you feel trapped. There is hope for you. Because what God did with His church on this earth, He's about to do in your life in Jesus' name. And somebody say amen. amen. Number seven, Samson's hair started to grow. And what happened with the church is God started to restore the church. The Bible says when Samson was going in circles, though he was blind, though he was bound, and though he was in circles, there's something started to happen. Samson's hair started to grow. What happened is that Martin Luther, when he nailed those theses on the wall of that church and he said, listen, this stuff is wrong. We can't be doing this. The Bible condemns it. The hair started to grow. When Azusa revival happened, the hair started to grow. When God started to restore worship in the church, the hair started to grow. When God started to restore the prophetic in the church, the hair started to grow. And though the church was still going in circles, but the hair was started to grow. When God is bringing deliverance, the hair is coming back. God is bringing deliverance back because God is restoring His church. 
We've seen the restoration of worship. We've seen the restoration of prophetic. We've seen the restoration of the apostolic. We've seen the restoration of so many graces. But I feel that there's a wave that is happening right now where the hair of the church, if I could use the word, God is restoring the anointing for deliverance. And you are a part of that restoration. Can somebody say amen? amen. Number eight. And this is the part, the next three things that I wanted to mention is what I see what is happening right now in our, in our generation. The verse I read was this. When the hair started to grow of Samson, I want you to notice what happened. They pulled him out to make fun of him. That's exactly what the world is doing to the church right now. Mocking the church. They brought Samson for entertainment. He was the joke of the day. What they missed is that his hair grew. What they missed about him is his hair grew. And the Bible says is, can I borrow a lad? Somebody that's like uh, 12 years old, 13 year old. Can I borrow one of you guys? Can you, can you come up? Can you come up? Come on, come up, come up. What's your, what's your name? Sam. Sam, Sam, how old are you? 10. You're 10, all right. I want you to hold my hand. What I've read that you maybe have missed is this. The Bible says a lad, a teenager, took Samson's hand and led Samson. He led Samson. He led Samson. So Samson and a teenager hold hands. They held hands. He led him to his greatest triumphing victory. I want you to see this image right now. Because that is exactly what God is about to do in the church. He's about to raise your children. He's about to raise your grandchildren. He's about to raise your great-grandchildren. The Bible says in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit upon your sons and your daughters. The church is not going to its final hour to be mocked. The church is going into its final hour with generations. Our kids do not belong to a woke propaganda. Our kids are not going to be mutilated. Our kids are not going to be brainwashed. Our kids will hold the hand of a church and go into revival with us. Devil, you can mock us. Devil, you can scorn us. You can write articles. But me and my family are going to go into the last hour together. The last days, God is going to do something incredible. What I see in my spirit happening is God will wake up the very kids that Disney is after. The very kids that Hollywood is after. The very kids that the Alphabet community said, we will reprogram them. God says in the last days, I will have a lad hold the hand of the church. They'll prophesy. They'll drive out demons. They will start small groups. They will see visions and they will see dreams. And they don't belong to Hollywood. They don't belong to Disney. And they don't belong to the Alphabet community. They belong to revival. Every parent that believes for their child to be saved, I was sent here to remind you, God has a place for your child in revival. God has a play for, place for your grandchild in revival. Every pastor that is here whose child doesn't serve God, I'm here on the assignment to remind you, your lad has a place. And the reason why the devil took him is because he knows once they join hands with the church, the church will break pillars. The church will shift pillars.
The next revival is going to be youth-led. This burns. I was a 14, 14 years a youth pastor. Right now we are in five public schools and I'm, I'm not against homeschooling. I think it's important. But I also believe not everybody can afford that. And I also believe that we need to send our youth on the mission. Not just to be protected in a public school, to hijack, to take over. LGBTQ does not have a solution. Our schools do not have a solution. The suicide rate will not be solved because we give it puberty blockers. Only the gospel. Only the gospel. And that's why these lads have to be equipped from 10 years old. Speak in tongues, know the Bible, and go into a public environment to shake things up. Most of Jesus' disciples were young men. And for those of you that are older, finance the revival. The hardest part is not to grow the church, is to grow the church young. Any revival that doesn't have this, doesn't have tomorrow. My pastor started the church 20 years ago. I was three years older than this young man. I remember he put me, I was 13, zero English. The only thing that was on my mind is to get a lot of ice cream because we couldn't afford that in Ukraine. Buy the bicycle and find me a girlfriend. Because celibacy, I knew celibacy wasn't my gift. And I remember my uncle would sit and he would say, Vlad, God will use you. You will reach the world. And then this goes in one ear, gets out of the other ear. The next Sunday, my pastor puts me to preach on the Sunday church. I thought it was just one Sunday kids show. We never had kids ministry for seven years. Our kids ministry was on the stage on Sunday morning. Every Sunday. Our church did not grow. Most people came in for the first Sunday, they're like, this is cool that you guys really prioritize kids. But like, when are we gonna get fed? And my pastor said, my goal is not to grow the church. A pastor pointed, he says, I want to grow these, they will grow the church. <laughs> 10 years. I'm not exaggerating one thing what I just said. Our church shrunk from 20 families to 15 families to about six families. For 10 years straight, every Sunday, my pastor didn't care. He only focused on building this. Now we build the church. Now those are the people that God uses. When I became a lead pastor at the age of 30, very young, my pastor gave me one job. He says, I don't care what you do during the week. I only care about one thing. Who is the next right after you? I said, Pastor, I'm only 30. I haven't even scratched the ministry. He said, there has to be 13, 14, and 15 year olds already following your shadow. Why am I saying this? I want to empower. The future belongs to those who can take the kids. And I'm not talking about building them better Sunday school. I'm talking about we need to treat our children like Mormons treat theirs. We need to have better youth groups than Mormons have their youth groups. They send their kids to evangelize at a young age. There is a specific strategic focus. The future of the church, the revival of the church, the future of what God wants to do cannot happen without the next generation. That's why God wants you to have children. Some of you are afraid to have kids. You're like, man, I don't know what's going to happen to my kids. This is what's going to happen to your kids. They will join forces with the church. God needs babies. God needs teenagers. 
God needs young adults. Why? Because the church's future is going to be mixed with the youth. Can somebody say amen? amen? Thank you so much for pouring a lot of sweat on your hand. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. Number nine. Samson had the greatest victory at the end of his life. I believe the church is headed to its greatest hour. I understand we've read the revivals of Catherine Coleman, Smith, Smith Wigglesworth, Lester Sumrall, Derek Prince. We've read the revival about the Azusa Street. And it does feel like, man, those were the great people. Who are we? We're just nobodies. But maybe that's what God's been waiting for nobodies who will tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. We might be faceless, nameless, but maybe that's what God's been waiting is to raise us up for such a time as this. Raise you up for such a time as this. Raise you up for such a time as this. We are headed into our greatest hour as a church. I'm not afraid of what the devil is cooking because I know what God has in store. In the last days, He will pour out His Spirit. There's greater measure of miracles, signs and wonders. More churches are going to be planted. More ministries are going to be birthed. More demons are going to be cast out. More movies are going to be made. We are going to be a force to be reckoned with because the church is God's last messenger for this world. Hallelujah. If you believe in the future of the local church, give God some praise. <laughs> and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as the witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. The end is not contingent on the birth of Antichrist. God controls the future, not AI. It shall come in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Isaiah 16 and 1, Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Haggai 2.9 The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Daniel chapter 2 verse 35 And then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like a chaff that were from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Habakkuk 2.14 For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered but the offense might abound. But where the sin abounded, grace abounded much. But it doesn't end there. More. Whatever devil is cooking, God says, I will do much more. That's why I believe the greatest revival is coming. Pastor, the greatest revival is coming to your church. There will be not enough room for people to be contained. There will be not enough room for people to be contained. Why? Because the greatest days of the church is coming. You may feel bound, you may feel weak, you may feel going in circles, you may feel like the best days are behind you, you may just remember all the good days, but you must understand your God is not done with you yet. He is bringing you to two pillars. He is bringing you to a season and to a place. He's about to break those pillars and release a new level of breakthrough and release a new level of anointing and release a new level of power in your church and in your ministry and in your family. Mom and dad, I want you to shake off disappointment. Rise up in your destiny and in your calling because the best days are coming to your house. 
Your best days were not before, they are still ahead of you. I am here to remind you prophetically, God is on the move. If it's not good, God's not done yet. He's still working behind the scenes and He will do a miracle in your midst, says the Lord. Hallelujah. The last thing, the tenth thing, is Samson lost his life in the victory. Persecution is coming. And no, I'm not talking about somebody attacking us on Facebook persecution. I'm not talking about somebody making fun of you. I'm talking about real persecution. It's coming. You cannot have revival without persecution. So I just want to encourage each and every one of us, beautiful, wonderful, those of us who have been overmothered and not matured and who have developed into spiritual beautiful snowflakes <laughs> who melt when things get hard. I want to challenge you today to be a soldier, not a snowflake. Sometimes people ask me why I don't respond to critics because those critics I have right now is just an appetizer. They're not assassins yet. They're not death threats. They're not coffins in the front lawn. Somebody making a video, that's not yet. The persecution that's coming is the one that happened to my great-grandfather where communists sent him for 10 years in prison and not American prisons where you have free dental care. Not those kind of prisons. Prisons where you die there. My great-grandmother was sending him crackers so he can survive there. Because of his good behavior, communists released him five years instead of sitting there for ten. As he was walking with his good friend to church, the communists were riding a, um, like a horse with a, um, like a carriage. And so they forced him to get on it. So he got on it. The moment he got on it, one guy is riding the horses. The other guy turned around and started beating my great-grandfather. So his best friend realized this is not going to end well, jumped and ran. My great-grandfather jumped but his foot got stuck in that cottage. So his body is dangling, hitting the, con the, the gravel and his foot, he can't untangle his foot and the guy stands over him. 40 minutes. They took circles around a small village until my grand-grandfather went completely unconscious and shortly after he died. That's persecution. So when things get hard for me and I get tempted to get overwhelming, I remember a day that I'm gonna meet one day my grand-grandfather. We want to share stories and I don't want to tell him my embarrassing ones. Persecution is one of Jesus' promises. Life without persecution is not promised. What's promised is persecution. If you're experiencing, you're living in God's promise. I want to encourage every person. I know we're in the West. We have more sermons on how to enjoy our life than how to endure our life. But Paul, still, Paul tells Timothy, he said, as a good soldier, endure suffering. He doesn't say cast out demons, cancel the assignment of the enemy, break the stronghold and everything. He says endure it. There are things God is going to take you through where you're going to just have to endure. I want to prepare us because this revival will come with the high cost. It will come with lawsuits. It will come with death threats and it will come with some of us losing our life. But if that's what's going to take, we're still going to die. I think it was um, John Wesley. He would constantly preach and people would throw stuff at him, uh, beat him. One day he went for three days without nobody's throwing stones at him. He got extremely concerned. He got off of his horse, he got on his knees and he said, Lord, if there is any hidden sin in my life that disqualified me from getting stones thrown in my face, I ask you please purge me, God. He starts praying. He says, God, I repent in any way that I have mistreated you. If I grieved you, Holy Spirit. And then as somebody threw a brick in his face. He got up. He said, God, thank you. You cleansed me. Yeah. 
I'm not saying to develop a martyrdom mentality. What I'm just saying is when it comes, you rejoice. Why? Because that's part of the revival. Come on somebody. I want you to rise to your feet. Did you receive something? I was just an appetizer. The main meal is going to come in just a moment. Before we turn over, if I can have the worship team to just come up briefly. I want to specifically right now pray for those parents whose kids don't serve God. Raise your hand if you have a child that doesn't serve Jesus. I want us to pray right now that in the next 12 months God's going to quicken that child's life. I'm not believing for salvation when they're on the deathbed. That's going to be a wasted life. We don't want a wasted life. And I want you to ask God, say, Lord, I know you need more lads for revival. Pick mine. Come on, tell the Lord, say, Lord, I didn't bring this kid into the world to be a drug user. I brought him into this world so he can be a gospel user, gospel preacher. Come on right now, open up your lips right now, wherever you are standing. Close your eyes. Even if you are Baptist, conservative, Pentecostal, I don't care. Just pray right now the way you were singing. Open up your mouth. Begin to cry out for your child. Begin to cry out for the revival of your family. In the second 10, those on Facebook, drop your child's name in the chat right now. Begin to just cry out right now. Close your eyes and begin to just lift your voice. See your child serving God. In the realm of the Spirit, in the heart, begin to see them prophesying. Begin to see them preaching. Begin to see them loving Jesus. Come on, begin to envision that child and pray with that prophetic prayer right now. Pray for the prophetic word right now that God use my son, use my daughter. Let them be your vessels in these last days. Let them be slaying demons. Let them be healing the sick. Let them be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up every teenager. Come on, let's lift them up on their hands of prayer. We lift up right now every young man and every young woman that doesn't serve you. In the name of Jesus, we, we beseech your throne right now. We ask you for mercy. You said to come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. You said to receive help in the time of need, God. We know right now that heaven, heaven plans an invasion on this earth. We know that heaven is planning an invasion. We know that Hollywood, we know that Disney, we know that this woke agenda has their plan on our generation. But right now we lift them up, God. We lift them up not as victims, but we lift them up as your warriors. We lift them up as demon slayers. We lift them up as giant killers. We lift them up as men and women of God. God. Lord, may they be used by you. May they be empowered by you. We tell every Pharaoh, let my kid go. We tell every Pharaoh, let my child go. Come on right now, begin to command every unclean spirit. You are their authority. Come on. You are their authority. Begin to command every Pharaoh, let my child go. Let my child go. You spirit of drugs. You spirit of perversion. You spirit of paganism. You spirit of atheism. You spirit of death. Out. Let my child grow that they will serve God and they will serve revival and they will serve God's agenda and they will serve God's plan. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. I want you to lift your hands. In the second tent as well, there's no distance. Let's invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come fly.
we're going to pray for deliverance just after the second session. But if you are sick in your body or you came with somebody that is terminally ill, I right now want to agree with you for your healing. There's still going to be more prayer for healing that's offered. I've seen the Lord heal people of incurable illnesses. I'm not the healer. I don't have healing anointing. I have a healing Savior. He's in this room right now. I don't need to touch you. He can touch you. By His stripes, you can be made whole. There's a revival atmosphere in this room. Miracles will be as easy as breathing. I'm going to ask you to place your hand upon the part of the body where you have pain. If you came with cancer, if you came with a kidney failure, if you came and you're on the last straw and you're believing for breakthrough, there's more ministry that's going to be offered in just a moment, but I want to begin already that the Holy Spirit is going to bring the miracle. If you own a house, you know what it's like when an AC gets broken. You're most interested to fix it. You are Holy Spirit's house. If your AC is broken, He's most interested to fix it. Place your hand upon the part of the body where there is pain. Say this out loud with me. Say, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is not for sickness. It's not for disease. It's for service. Say, right now, I take authority over every spirit of infirmity. And I command it to leave right now. Say, I break every generational curse of chronic disease and premature death in the name of Jesus. Be broken right now. Say, Oh Holy Spirit, touch me right now. Come on, keep your hand there. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that nothing is impossible to you. And I ask you right now that the anointing of the Holy Spirit from the one side of the tent to the other side of the tent, from the back to the front, in Jesus' mighty name, I command that sickness to leave right now. I command that pain to leave right now. I command every cancer cell dry up right now and disappear. Every tumor, every growth, every cyst, every fibroid, in the name of Jesus, leave right now. Every issue in your digestive system, be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Blind eyes open, deaf ears open. Weakness in the legs, receive strength right now. Every damaged nerve and every broken spine, every damaged fractured back, be healed in Jesus' name. I speak the Word of God of healing to those who received injuries, for those who received accidents, be restored right now. Some of you feel heat going through the part of the body. That is the power of the Holy Spirit touching you. Be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Touch them, Holy Ghost, right now. I'll rebuke that sickness in Jesus' name. Come on, lift your hands. Right now, lift your hands. I just begin to thank you. In your own words, don't shout, but just with your words, just begin to thank Him. Say, Lord, I thank You that You are my healer. Say, Lord, I thank You that You are my restorer. Come on, as you lift your hands, you're releasing that sickness. You're releasing it. Say, Lord, this doesn't belong in me because You took it on Your body. It is illegal in my body because You took it on Yours. Jesus, I let that go right now. I let go of any unforgiveness. I let go of any bitterness right now, and I release that. Anxiety, mental illness, I release that right now. In the name of this PTSD, I release that right now. That headache is leaving right now. That depression is leaving right now. That gastritis is leaving right now. That asthma is leaving right now. That TB is being broken right now. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. Receive your healing right now, right where you are standing. Receive your healing right now, right where you are standing. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Say, Jesus, I thank you. Come on, every hand raised and sing that one more time. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Don't flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Oh, glory, God is warming our hearts on to be over. 
those of you who you had pain in your body I want you to look for that pain now you couldn't move without pain I want you to examine some of you I know that what weeks and months later you would post somewhere online hey at that conference I got healed but if you notice that the pain that you had and after that the pain is gone wave both of your hands at me Make sure you testify. Post it on Facebook. Let somebody know. Let your small group leader, leader know. Let somebody know. The Bible says, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Everybody likes to gossip. We need to share more stories and testimonies. Amen. I'm going to do one more thing before I turn it over. And that is this. And I really felt, especially when I was at the book table, and quite a few kids that came up and whose parents are believing for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I just mentioned about children and I mentioned about the youth. If you are here and I know it's hot, but you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to pray one prayer. It's going to be very quick. But the water comes out of the faucet very quick too. It doesn't take hours in America. It just gushes out. I'm going to give just one simple instruction. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. When you speak in tongues, you don't get the Spirit. The Spirit gets you. When you speak in tongues, you're now receiving the Spirit. You're releasing the river. Jesus says, out of their belly. He didn't say out of their mind, but out of their belly. That means the river is already in your belly. All we got to do is open the faucet. How do you do that? It's very simple. You let go. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pray in just a moment. And there will be hundreds of people. They'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit instantly. Why? Because this is a revival atmosphere and miracles happen here and the Holy Spirit wants to affect your mouth and it's gonna happen. My friend uh, one time shared a story with me when one father was teaching his daughter how to pray and he told his daughter to pray the Lord's Prayer. So the next day he comes to her house, he comes to her room listening and she's not praying the Lord's Prayer, she's praying the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G and then she finished it with the last letter and said Amen. He said, okay, I taught her the Lord's Prayer. Why is, she doing, why is she doing alphabet? The next day, she's praying the alphabet again. And the third day, he couldn't get the... He, he's like, I, I can't stand this. She, she's, she's, she's praying a heretical prayer. He asked his daughter, he says, hey, why are you praying the alphabet? I taught you the Lord's Prayer. She says, daddy, so simple. I give God the letters. I trust Him to arrange them as He likes to. You know what speaking in tongues is? You release sounds by faith. God adds meaning to them. It's not complicated. You release sounds from where? Not from here. From here. And sometimes it's one syllable. But it's from here. The Bible says out of your belly. So you're not asking God to give you tongues from heaven. They're not in heaven. They're in your belly. Out of your belly will flow the rivers of living water. Just raise your hands right now. For those of you who desire to receive that, the Lord's gonna, a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost is gonna touch you. Say this together with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you as my Lord and Savior. You are the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I ask you, fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I trust in you. That as I release the sound from my the spirit, from your spirit, you will add meaning to it. Baptize me right now with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Come on, release that sound right now. Come on, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Be filled with the fire of God right now. Be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Don't overthink it. Don't let it go. Don't let it come from your mind. Close your eyes. Whatever the sound that comes from your spirit, 
Just release them right now. Kita la mama sokoto romo no yalema na soto rabaka lebere. Lama na lama konda rabo silima na lemanda le bro kombale de ke lema na sinta rabo. Libos ya la bro kila bara la bara la bere bere de kala la bere de ya. Holy Ghost fire fall on you right now. Holy Ghost fire fall on you right now. Holy Ghost fire fall on you right now. Receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, take next 30 seconds. Just pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Every person that is filled with the Holy Ghost, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray mysteries to God. Worship Him in another tongue. Sing to Him in the other tongue right now. You don't need a song. You got a song inside of you right now. You got a song in your spirit. You got a tongue in your spirit right now. Just release them. I see tears rolling down people's eyes. I see the power of God falling right now. The fire of God falling right now. Some of you for the first time are speaking in tongues. I feel like a drizzle of rain falling in this room right now. It is so refreshing and it's called the Holy Ghost. Come on, open up your mouth right now and just release that. Release the river of living water, the refreshing water. The release, the rest is in those tongues. The refreshing is in those tongues. Edification is in those tongues. We love your Holy Spirit. We love your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Host the Holy Ghost, a new book that I wrote that just got released. I want to invite you into a journey of knowing the Holy Spirit more. When you read this book, you will be able to have an encounter, I believe, with the Holy Spirit. The one that I had, somebody introduced me to the Holy Spirit and I believe God can use me to bring you into a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, activate God's anointing, as well as learn more about the Holy Spirit. Discern the difference between Kundalini Spirit and Holy Spirit manifestations. Learn about tongues and so much more. So get your copy today. Whether you are in ministry, in business, stay home mom or a student, you will learn how to develop closer walk with the Holy Spirit by reading this book. As all of my books, they're available on Amazon in paperback, hardcover, audio version. There's a Russian version, Spanish version, and you can download it on my website as a free PDF. Thank you so much and I can't wait to hear testimonies of people's lives being impacted as they read Host the Holy Ghost. And if you read this book and enjoy it, make sure that you leave a review on Goodreads and Amazon so that other people can discover it.